All right. Greg McEwen, welcome to the show. It's so nice to be with you. Well, uh, you wrote a book. It's provided a lot of food for thought, and it it has given me some focus in my life. It's called Essentialism, and it's all about figuring out what's the most important things in life and focusing only on those things to be more effective in your work or in your life. And we're going to get into deeper what essentialism is. I'm curious, did you have a personal experience where you were trying to do a whole bunch of different things all at the same time, but you were doing them all poorly that led you down this path of exploring essentialism? I had an experience that that left a mark on me where I was... I received an email from uh, my manager at the time that said Friday would be a very bad time for your wife to have a baby. And Friday was, in fact, the day that uh, we were in the hospital. Uh, my daughter had been born middle of the night the night before. Uh, but instead of being focused on that clearly important essential moment, I felt torn. Uh, I could do both. The, the, the right answer was to try and do both. Could I be at the meeting that I'd been asked to, to attend? or should I stay where I was and stay focused? And so I'm taught how both. And, you know, to my shame, I went to the meeting and uh, afterwards, actually, I remember being told, oh, the client will respect you for the choice you just made. I, you know, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that they did respect the choice I'd made. Uh, the, fa- the look on their faces did not evince that sort of confidence. And yet, even if, uh, even if they had, uh, surely I'd made a fool's bargain. And, and it was from that that I learned a simple lesson, which is if you don't prioritize your life, uh, someone else will. And, and, and so this coalesced many, many years of thinking in the, in the strategy world, working with Silicon Valley companies. And I suddenly saw the crescendo, the, the, the connection between these two uh, these two efforts, a uh, phenomenon I'd seen in, in business and how it might be applied uh, to individuals. Okay. Yeah, I think we've all had experiences like that where you have to, there's two choices, you try to do both and you do both poorly and it doesn't work out great. So let, let's dig into deeper about what is an essentialist and what a non like the difference between an essentialist and a non-essentialist is sort of a, a big picture overview of those two types of approaches. Well, um, first, uh, let's start with a non-essentialist. A non-essentialist is someone who, instead of just at one time, like I'm describing, okay, let's do both, has that basic logic deep inside of them, so deep that I think they don't even know it's there. It's dominant assumption. It's just invisible to them because it's so ubiquitous. And, And the idea really is, Look, I have to do everything because it's all important. It's all equally important. So I just have to do it all. And and if I do it all, somehow that will lead to breakthrough success. And and that's basically the logic of a non-essentialist. If I can, if I can, it's all important. So I have to do it all. And if I can do it all, then I'll get it all. I'll get these results, these breakthroughs. And a lot of people today are uh, are involved and consumed in that. And, and what it leads to is not what it promises. What it leads to is people who are stretched too thin uh, at work or at home. It leads to people feeling busy but not productive. And this this cultural norm where really everyone's life is being hijacked by other people's agenda all the time. That's the result of the non-essentialist mindset. Uh, The essentialist is is radically different to the culture of our times, but really only in the most in in the simplest and most sensible ways. They're not really radical. They're they're just facing some reality, like some things are really really important and most stuff isn't. I therefore need to make trade-offs and figure out what is essential and what isn't, and just pursue the things that are essential, eliminate what's not. Okay. Well, so here's a question I have. This assumption that people have that they can do everything because everything's equally important. Where does that assumption come from? Because like when you you look at it from a, you know, big picture, you take a step back, you're like, that's crazy talk, yet we still have that assumption. It's, it's, It's the right question. Where does it come from? 
did, did it just did it just come from you from me you know did we just did we choose it deliberately consciously um, or is there something more broadly to uh, at play and it's the latter and it's very important because it explains the phenomenon which is that it's not just one or two people it's not just you and me it's it's not just a few of the people listening i mean it's just almost everybody everywhere so it doesn't matter what industry i'm in it doesn't matter what level of seniority it's just people everywhere are feeling this it's in the zeitgeist and so tracing its history is helpful for context so that we can then address it because we can't really consciously change what we have not correctly diagnosed and so let's really back up like a long way let's go back to like 1400s and and that's important because it's pre-industrial revolution and it's it is clearly a very different era and this is when the word priority came into the english language and it was singular priority what did it mean the very first thing the prior thing and it it stayed singular according to drucker for the next 500 years so for half a millennium people weren't pluralizing this term and so it became pluralized in the 1900s as people are grappling with the efficiency systems of factories and that that produced tremendous breakthroughs but it, it it there were lessons that applied to machines that didn't apply to humans and one of them was the sense of the prioritization so so now people start talking about priorities but what does it even mean i mean can you have very very many very first before all other things things uh it is truly a madness and it's it, i think it's hard to define in any sensible way what the word priorities really means so that's phase 1 phase 2 was in the post second world war where uh, as people came back from this cataclysmic discombobulating experience they didn't recombobulate meaning we didn't as a as an international cult you know community or culture mourn the loss create some space figure out what matters most figure out how to rebuild things no we went for the fast the quick fix we went for instead of more more community we went for for, for buying stuff and there's a very deliberate strategy this wasn't like just happenstance there are the work you know people sitting in departments sitting in Washington DC trying to institute what i've called the panem strategy panem comes from the latin it's uh, it's circus and bread and it was all about almost literally turning consumerism into a religion and and how can we keep people on this cadence of having to watch television where they're going to learn what stuff they have to buy to be happy what everybody's going to do and then buying that stuff so having to work harder in order to get those new televisions to see that stuff and it was this immense cycle and spiral it wasn't possible until you had the groundwork of the industrial revolution the mindset that came with that but it built upon it and accelerated it and then phase 3 the the third era of non-essentialism is in the last 10 years and we've all been witness to that and it says we've gone from being connected to hyper connected so as social media and smartphones uh, have have come together in a sort of unholy alliance it's it's it, we've gone from information overload to opinion overload So all of this is cultural context for now. And it's really important we understand that otherwise we can't do anything about it. And and I just want to pause on that part because it's all a little bit a little bit disheartening the present to hear that how how so sort of developed this has been and how how consuming but but what I want to say is that none of these things are of themselves inherently bad. Like some of the, some of the assumptions are just false so those are bad but but the tools that we have can be utilized by non-essentialists or essentialists but the thing is to change the mindset uh, you know the, these new technology the smartphones and the social media these things make great servants just poor masters and uh, and so that's where we have to be we have to step into a new role where we become 
much more designful, thoughtful, create space to reflect on what we want to do with the tools that we have, or they will simply run us. And it won't just be, you know, me making this you know, really bad choice sitting in the hospital, but it will be all of us making micro trade-offs we never really meant to because these things are acting on us rather than us acting on them. Right. And I mean, you talk about this in the book, all this bombardment of information, choices that we get, um, it, it does create a sense of learned helplessness. You talk about learned helplessness in the book. And we've discussed that on the website and the podcast where people just, they kind of give up. They don't, they don't think they can control their lives and they just allow, like, as you said earlier, you, they allow other people to set the agenda in their life. Well, and, and the, the, the twist on learned helplessness in, in the book that I stand by is that, that normally learned helplessness, in fact, it's sort of inherently described as, as something that you, um, like you stop acting. It's, you know, it's the, it's the dog that won't move because they think there's no point. And so it creates a sort of, um, yeah, inaction in people. But, but I, I found that there's another kind of helplessness, which is constantly moving. It's constant activity. It's, there's nothing, I have to do everything. There's nothing I can do. There's no way out of this. You know, it might be okay for other people, but not for me. I've got all these people acting on me. I've got all these, I've got my boss. I've got my, my managers. I've got all the different people in the community. Uh, yeah, I've got people. And, and, and the sheer size of, it, it, just, it just leads people to think they have to live as a non-essentialist. And that there is no other choice. Uh, and, and so that is a kind of, uh, it's kind of a hyper-learned helplessness. Right. And, and the, one of the insidious things about this non-essentialist approach is, like you said earlier, people, they try to do everything all at once because they think if they do, then success will come. But then when that success comes, it just opens up more choices, more opportunities, quote unquote, um, where you have to repeat the cycle all over again. Okay. So let's talk about, uh, about that a little bit because a f- process I found that people in that companies in Silicon Valley followed was instructive both at the business strategy level, but also on the self leadership strategy level. Uh, and the, the the phenomenon is this: that I noticed that Silicon Valley companies had a, a few people at the beginning in the early days focused on just the right problem at just the right time, and this led to success. And with success came options and opportunities. And with options and opportunities, there was a risk. I mean, that sounded like the right problem to have, but the risk was that it would undermine the very things that led to success in the first place. If all those new options and opportunities led to what Jim Collins, the researcher, has called the undisciplined pursuit of more. And it's that undisciplined pursuit of more that we ought to be wary of. Uh, this is, you know, in companies, this is where suddenly they have the resources, so they go on a hiring spree and they're hiring too fast and they're hiring t- too thoughtlessly. They're throwing people at problems, but suddenly they're undermining the culture that led to their success and, and everyone's got all these good ideas and they're coming to the table, but there's, there's more ideas than there is discipline inside the company. And so you end up starting to spread the culture and, and, and the focus and resources of the company uh, too thin. And, and what is the result of all of this? Does trying to do all of it actually help you break through to the next level of success? It does not. What it does predictably and really rarely, with rare exceptions, it leads to a plateauing of progress and even the slow death of the company. And so so I just wanted to to, to draw a distinction there, which is that when you focus, it leads to success. But success itself is another one of these poor masters. If, if we let success lead us, if we take the natural instinctive next steps that success and the options of success would guide us towards, we're already off the path and we'll get pulled way, way off. And this is the, this is the theory that explain, explains how these juggernaut success companies, these once unstoppable firms, have become completely, uh, you, know, you know, just just these immensely uh, difficult companies to run or think through, uh, 
because uh, and it was success that was the thing. Now the question is, both at the organization level or the personal level, is how do we become successful at success? And that is where essentialism comes in. So I would argue that non-essentialism literally, simply does not produce success. It's just correlated with success because you see it at the same time as success is present. Well, let's but it never generates success. Right. Well, I, well so I mean, this is a question maybe we can get to later. But like, there are some companies, I'm thinking like Google or Amazon, who they start off with a core competency, but they're, they've somehow been able to expand into other areas that are somewhat related, and they've been able to do it deftly. I'm thinking Google, they start off with search, and then they introduced Gmail, and they introduced Maps. What, what is it that, that Google's doing, for example, that allows them to take to explore these new options yet still maintain their ability to be successful in the one thing that they're good at so so where does google's primary profit margin uh, margin and center still lie search search ads by like a by small small margin massive margin it's massive i believe <laughs> massive margin is it's, it's the thing that makes money for them still that's it still so here we are, 20 years on, many moonshots later, and still their primary income comes from a, a certain place. Now, I, I'm, I'm not trying to hit Google. I suppose we'd all like to fail like Google. <laughs> but, but it is staggering to me and should grab our attention that, I mean, you, you mentioned these add-ons, right, which, which have been well integrated but they're, they're extensions of exactly the same product. They're search. Maps, it's search. The purchase of YouTube. I, I talked to the CEO at the time when they, they, they just purchased YouTube and, and talking about that. I mean, he said, look, they, YouTube was lucky. That there's a half a dozen or a dozen companies that we could have picked. We ended up picking YouTube. We had to pick somebody. Um, they're, you know, they're picking things to put into their search engine so people don't go anywhere else. Now, I'll give them high marks for having – kept and protected and developed that thing. There's just no doubt, right? I mean, Bing came uh, searching after them. Uh, excuse the pun. Uh, you know, Yahoo's been fighting also still for that, that same space over the time and many others. They, they've done a great job in doing that. Where they have largely failed is to produce a second big thing. It, it, you see, so they've had all this money this tremendous economic machine. They're very, really rare in companies to have that much cash on hand. And, and they have, I believe, desired to do something important and significant with it. But what, what does it all amount to? Uh, what happened to Google Glass? What has happened still with the driverless cars? And I'm not, I'm not saying the game, that it is all done with driverless cars, but, but when you say we're going to do Google Glass and we're going to do Fiverr and we're going to do uh, driverless cars, and, 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 right? When you go that broadly and you keep investing in them, why do you keep investing in them? Because you can. If you've got your billions and billions that you want to spend and you want to do these big things and you've got these great desires, I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with the desire to make an impact in the world and there's nothing wrong with having loads of money in the bank with which to do things. These are, these are the problems people want to have. But a an insufficiently selective criteria and approach will undermine the chance to break through to the next level. Have they broken through to the next level? Have they got the second, the second search, the massive, you know, revenue generating, world impacting service or product? No. I will maintain the answer to that is no. Now, maybe they say we don't want that. Maybe we're happy to use our resource, you know, our R&D, you know, energies just to help spark new ideas and so on will be sort of the NASA of, uh, of, the, of the business world. We'll just keep on spending money that, that, that isn't for a single mission, but is, yeah. I mean, just think of the language that they're using, even on these big, exciting, on the face of them, bombastic and bold and visionary efforts, the moonshot. Yes, but how many moonshots can you have? I mean, if NASA had had five different moonshots, if they had a moonshot plus a mind shot plus a, you know, if they if they're trying to do all these massive things, they won't get there. So it's no surprise at all to watch Google 
uh, glass go down. I mean, I was just waiting for that. Of course, that's going to happen. No surprise to see Google, uh, uh, you know, um, the uh, I certainly can't remember fiber, Google Fiber, be be paused because you you can't go massive on everything. It's not really that surprise. That, now the, the car is out. We'll see, right? The car is a huge opportunity for any company that can crack the code on it. It's a massive, massive driverless cars are clearly a huge opportunity, right? Tesla's obviously positioning themselves for it. Apple is putting resources into it. Google's putting resources into it. But what have we seen yet in terms of profitability coming out of, of, of Google on that? Zero, right? It's a completely unprofitable center still. And, and my, of course, there may be more time. But what I'm trying to illustrate here is that is that I think that, that this phenomenon, you know, Google, with all its money and resources, cannot escape the foundational principle, which is that you you can either do a whole bunch of things averagely well, or you can do a few things superbly well, given the same set of resources. And if you do a few things superbly well, you are more likely to break through to the next level. And 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 so and so, I love the Google example. I love riffing on that because it helps to make the point. Even if you have that many resources, you can't do it all. You can't break through in everything. And so how much more so for, for, for you and I and for everyone who's listening in our own lives with, with the finite time resources, energy resources, financial resources that we have to be selective and thoughtful about which things really will take us to the next level of contribution. And we'll talk about that, how you figure that out. But I, I'm curious. So if the the underlying assumption of a non-essentialist is I can do it all, I don't have to make trade-offs, what's the assumption that the essentialist takes towards life? Is it just the opposite? Well, it says this. It begins with this idea that a, f- a few things are incredibly valuable. few things. And most of it's noise. So, you know, it's, um, it's like, to use a metaphor, the, you know, it's like waking up having believed that life was, was analogous to, uh, to a coal mine in which my job is to get as much of this out as possible, right? This is just a quantity game. And to wake up and suddenly go, oh, I've never been in a coal mine. The whole my whole life, it's been a diamond mine. So, it's not a quantity game in in the same sense. It's all about finding, thoughtfully, carefully, so finding those massively valuable things that are in here, hidden. But I need to find them carefully and thoughtfully. So now that's a very different process. You'd approach it really differently. And so I think that this is this is the 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 beginning place of becoming an essentialist. It's in fact once somebody really believes that, once they once they have unlearned non-essentialist mindset, which is the harder part, and then absorb it and taken in the essentialist mindset, a few things truly valuable. A lot of the rest of it becomes spontaneous and intuitive uh, because because you you suddenly just see the world differently. It's like it's like taking off a bad pair of glasses. It's like we've been wearing a pair of glasses that that make it all seem like it's about about equal value, um, and suddenly going, oh my goodness, most of this stuff is just literally rubbish. Most of this stuff is worth nothing. I mean, honest to goodness, how much time do we spend doing things of almost zero value? You know, it might be fine to check ESPN, you know, for, for, for a team, for... And there's, there's a space for this. For sure there is. But is it worth the kind of time people put into it? Isn't there a diminishing returns where somebody just keeps checking it and checking it, the latest score from the latest teams and all the different teams and all the teams of the playoffs are constantly going back and forth between all of it and it's hours and hours and what does it all add up to? What does it all equal? Yeah, a hundred years from now, will it matter? No, of course it won't matter. It won't matter a hundred days from now, but it won't matter a hundred years from now. And this is sort of the test. You, you can test it in this in this way, but that's now onto another riff. I'll pause. 
Right. Well, so I think, you know, figuring out what's essential and not essential, that's like the example you just gave ESPN, surfing the web, like people like that's, yeah, of course, that's not essential. If I cut more of that, and that's my life will be better. But like the really hard things are the things that you do in work or in life that seem important, right? Like it seems like it's doing something, but it really isn't. So how, I mean, how do you figure that out? How do you figure out these activities you take part in, whether at work or in your personal life that you've done forever because you feel like you've had to do it, but they don't actually provide any value. Well, I think that, I think that it's, it's perspective, isn't it? That, that when you're saying, well, ESPN is sort of obvious, this is sort of, it's because you have a perspective that makes that obvious. It, it's for somebody, there are some people it's not obvious to <laughs> that they, they, it hasn't even occurred to them. So why has it occurred to you? You have a perspective that says, well, I, I just get that these things, you know, my family, my service, maybe church service, that these things matter more than spinning and surfing on, on the internet. There's this perspective you've got. Now, what we can do, where we can go is is to push that perspective out further. So, so as one example, I used to think that it was really pretty bold perspective to think about my life from birth to death so i'd have people even work with them when i co-created a class at the d school um at stanford that was what we had birth to death thinking and we would take them on this huge journey this huge narrative of where were you when you were born and what did you do next and where are you now over all these years and where do you want to be but that's like a very broad perspective and far longer term thinking than than really anybody in the class had really done you know, they might have paid a little lip service to it occasionally. But I realized later, and I didn't realize it fast enough to, to change it there, that my perspective was far too narrow, even then, far too short term, that it was I was I was guilty of, uh, of a very self-centered perspective, uh, which is that, you know, my life basically can be judged within the period of my life. And wh- why is that the case? Why would that be true? I mean, that's, that's just because that, that's the period I'm here. But I realized that, that what I needed to do was push people's thinking back to, let's say, their great-grandparents. So parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, the full spectrum back, and start to, to get an intergenerational narrative. I call it a 100-year vision because it's from today, it's a 100 years before us, and a hundred years ahead of us. And that is much more powerful lens. What I learned in the process was that most people you know, really can't tell, t- tell me anything about who their great grandparents even were, where they, w- what they did, how they thought, what the choices they made, what trade-offs they made, nothing. And, and, and so there's this massive blind spot for each of us, but the, most of us are shaped by people we know nothing about whatsoever. So most of us, the language we speak, the country we live in, yeah, you know, the attitudes we have, that there's deep assumptions and, 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 and expectations, and all of this shaped by people, family, ways of communicating, all sorts, and we don't even know about them. And so it makes us blind to the massive ways we've been impacting uh, the world and how we're unintentionally affecting all these things. So you go way, way back and you start to create the narrative, the decisions that they made, and you start to discern which decisions great-grandparents made, grandparents made, parents made, which decisions still impact me now? Which things have lasted 100 years? Which things do I care about? Which things have had a big positive effect? Which things have had a big negative effect? So that we can start to discern what really matters, not what matters temporarily, what mattered in a big way that lasted all these years. Then we go forward extrapolating from that 100 years in the future. It's a very important number because none of us are going to be here 100 years from now. So it's very important that we break that perspective of, well, on my deathbed, what will people say about me? I mean, who cares? Well, we've got to go beyond that. We've got to say, what about your great-grandchildren? Or if we have no children, just other people that we've influenced generations ahead, what will they care about? 
what will have impacted them? What will make a difference? And, and, and I put it to you that that perspective will reveal the difference between the merely good things and the very few truly essential ones. And, and, and that's, that's the way I think to approach this. I love that, that perspective, adding that perspective. But so here's the challenge. Let's say you do this. And I think it's for people's personal lives, they can figure that out. Like, okay, family, definitely important. Um, there's these obligations or responsibilities in church or my community or whatever, obviously important. But let's say on your work level, right? If you're working for an, a, an employer and you do this analysis and you, th- you decide like, well, these meetings that I had to go to once a week, like, they're not important in that grand scheme of things. How do you, how do you tell your boss? Like, I don't, I don't think these meetings are essential. Do you tell your boss that? And if so, like, how do you do so in a way where you can get them on board with that? Well, I don't think that the way to think about uh, negotiating with your boss is to simply say, well, no, you know, I didn't write a book called Noism, but I do think it's often or maybe even always reasonable to have a conversation. I remember one time I was being uh, given a new assignment from my uh, direct leader and he'd already given me probably four fairly major projects to work on. And here was the next one. And all of the projects were interesting to me. They were all good. And he obviously thought they were all valuable. But when he brought in this additional one, in the past, I would have said, well, Okay, he wants it doing, and 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 we do it. There would have been no pause, no consideration, no, no, no not even a, a thought of a negotiation because we just want to move forward. And and my desire to move forward wasn't any less. But I realized how you know this nonsense of non essentialism. You can't just do everything, you know, all now and all equally well. So what I said to him is, look, I'm very happy to do that. What you know, do you want me to do? You know, five things averagely well, or do you want me to do one or maybe two of these things really superbly well and just, you know, go all out on it? And it didn't take him more than half a moment to respond to that. He said, oh, we'll find somebody else to do this fifth project. Uh, in fact, of all these projects, there's one that is a clear winner for me. He, he said what it was. I agreed with it completely. I thought that was the priority project. And, and the other things ended up being removed. And I focus on that for the next year. Uh, as a result of that made a serious impact on the thing that he and I had identified as the most important thing. That's more in range of what I think is realistic and what is appropriate. And of course, it might not always work in that picture perfect way I just described. But what I'm, inviting people to do is to bring the reality into the conversation, to not pretend that we simply can do everything perfectly well. Uh, We all, I think, do know perfectly well that that isn't true. And so if you can bring that into the conversation, you're not saying no, you're not being impertinent, uh, you're dealing with reality. And uh, I think there are appropriate ways to do that. Right. So don't be afraid to start the conversation. At least. Well, I think that's right. I think essentialism and non-essentialism are conversations. I think that's the beginning of any culture change uh, is, is to be able to have the language. So I, I think it can be very advantageous to have not just you, for example, read essentialism and know about it, but to have, have your boss read it, have, you, have everybody on the team read it. So that there's language here. It doesn't mean you suddenly say no to everything and everyone without thinking about it, that, that's, that's a thoughtless approach. But you can start to have the conversation. And we ought to do that because non-essentialism is so unsustainable and so silly. Well, this kind of leads nice to a next question. So the book isn't called Noism, but to live an essentialist life, you have to say no to things. But I think for a lot of people, they're afraid to say no. So they don't want to let people down. They're they're afraid that it might you know cost them you know their job or their standing in their job. How do you overcome that fear of saying no? So you can focus on what's important. Is it is is it the, the approach instead of thinking I had to say no? Say, be have it rather. Let me have a conversation with you about this first. The first stage to developing the leadership competency of elimination, of saying no, uh, 
The first stage is to learn to pause. And it can be the tiniest pause. Just somebody says, oh, hey, can you do this? And you just go, oh, um, let me think about that. And that's it. You might still say yes, but you develop the ability to pause and realize, oh, this is a new thing. This is another thing. Maybe then you start to learn one question. You ask one question. Normally, you just said yes without thinking about it, without clarification. You pause, you ask a question. It, it, eventually, in that space, you find new skills can be layered in. And I do think it's a full leadership competency, the ability to say no, the ability to negotiate, the ability to eliminate non-essentials is its own competency. It has to be developed. And, the, and, and, and I've come to understand that better since the book was published than I did before. I used to think people have the skills already developed and all they need is a new mindset. And that can be true for people, but it's often not true. It's often the case that people believe that they can only really have two options. And one is the polite yes. And the second is the rude no. And they think those are the only two choices. So as a result, because they don't want to be that sort of person, they end up saying the polite yes all the time. So the question is, is how to discover the middle space? And I think it's important people don't jump all the way to the, you know, to close to the rude no at first. You stay over at the polite yes, but a polite, what about a polite pause? Uh, what about a polite, hey, can we talk about this a little more? What about asking the question? Well, look, can we just talk about what we think is the, you know, the, the most important thing to be done? You know, what's, what are the two or three things that will really move the needle this quarter, this week, this year? And slowly as you develop the ability to negotiate non-essentials, you will find uh, s stronger uh, muscles uh, of, of being formed so that eventually, I mean, I think there is a way that people can, can evolve all the way to, oh, can you do this? Well, actually, no, I don't think I can do it. But by that point, there's a developed set of skills and trust and relationship that's been formed. So you don't want to go from being, you know, polite, yes, on the one hand, and then hugely shift because you've heard this idea or you read the book Essentialism and now you go all you know, overkill on the other side. You've got to take it step by step. Think about it as a continuum from the polite yes, step by step over until you've learned uh, what, what works and what doesn't work and, and you develop this skill. And, and part of you know, maneuver, navigating that skill set um, is you have to know like, what is important. Like what is truly essential? So you talk about in your book this idea of the essential intent. And when I read it, it sounded like a, a mission statement that people hear, you know, and they roll their eyes. But it's not. Like how is it different from – how is essential intent different from, a, say, a corporate mission statement or even a personal mission statement? Well, first of all, I mean, the, the idea of a vision and mission statement in their <clears throat> original idea – was perfectly positive, good, you know, and I'm in favor of it. But the, the reason people roll their eyes is not because vision mission statements aren't good ideas. It's because they've seen them almost universally badly executed. Well, what does that mean? It, it, you know, uh, example, I was, I remember actually at business school uh, being given an assignment. It was about 70 in the class or something. And, and each of us has been given an assignment to, 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 find a vision or mission statement in a nonprofit organization, bring it to class, read it out. Each of us bring one or two of them. We do that. As we're going through these statements, the room just really starts laughing at these statements. You know, there's a six person um, organization and their mission statement is to, you know, to, to, to end world hunger, which is a perfectly inspiring idea other than it's so disconnected to the reality of the organization no one believes in it so it sounds inspirational but actually it isn't it's it, you know it, it melts on contact it, it's just it's not real and people can feel that so it's it, it's not really inspirational in the end i remember as we continued going through this somebody um somebody put their hand over they said well i've got brad pitt's you know vision set from his uh uh, from his nonprofit, and by this point, everyone's laughing. So, Brad Pitt, what's he going to have to say? And uh, and, and they read it out, and, and this was the vision statement. This was the statement of uh, the purpose statement: was we're going to build 
250 storm-resistant homes in the 8th Circuit of New Orleans that, uh, that, that are also sustainable by this date. And when they read it, it seemed to take the oxygen out of the room. And it was almost a reverent moment as people realized, oh, that is what a clear intent looks like, sounds like. We, you know, they will know when they're done. And they might well choose a new intent. That doesn't have to be the end. You have to put yourself out of existence necessarily, but you know when it's done. And it stood in such contrast to these other kinds of vision and mission statements, these, these, um, un, uh, these incomprehensible, general vision and mission statements that nobody, just no one knows what they really mean. And so what people have experienced with these kinds of things, is, is it, it lacks clarity, which is ironic because that's the whole point of them is to produce clarity, to produce direction and purpose. But most of them, and I really do mean most, I mean, certainly my experience is almost universally that these kinds of statements are not fit for purpose. They don't enable people to make trade-offs in their day-to-day work. So an, an, an essential intent, I mean, in some ways, if I'm, if I'm honest, they're just really good vision mission statements. I mean, they just work because you've gone all the way from this generalized statement to something of clarity. A lot of people say, even CEOs and executives I work with, when I talk to them about this at first, they'll say, well, look, I think we're pretty clear, Greg, you know, about what we're trying to do. And I always want to say, well, yeah, there's, you know, as a person who wears glasses, the difference between pretty clear and really clear is really different. And, and that's what we're talking about here. An essential intent is what you really are trying to do. The, the, the concrete and inspirational, but especially the concrete objective, the priority, the thing you're really about. And when people have them, you know you have it because basically it's one decision that's made a thousand decisions. You you can keep coming back to that again and again until it's achieved. And you can say, look at 10 different options, 20 different options, and start to evaluate them. Which of these options is most likely to bring us forward and, and accelerate us towards this intent. You, you can actually use it in making decisions and making trade-offs. That's how you know you've arrived. That's how you know you've achieved it. Yeah, I like that idea that you, you know when you're, when you're forced to make a trade-off. That's like, you know, because like it's, it's, if I do this, will this help me move forward on my, that intent? No. Okay, that's a trade-off. Exactly. And, and of course, trade-offs are the essence of strategy. They're the essence of, if, you, if you're not making trade-offs, you, you don't have a strategy. If, if you're not consciously making it, then you don't have a conscious strategy. And, and, you know, what we've learned is that, is that you do need two, two kinds of strategy in, in your life or in your business. One is emergent strategy. And that's the one I think we tend to default to. That's where, uh, you know, you, you, you see the response of your boss today. You see what's going on. You, you, you and you, you kind of respond to it in hopefully an intelligent way in the moment. That's, Emergent strategy. You're learning by doing, by being aware and, and conscious of what's going on around you. That's type one. Type two is deliberate strategy. That's where essential intent comes in. You say, look, longer term, what are we really trying to do? Uh, I mean, of course, we've talked already about this hundred year vision. It doesn't have to be as, 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 as hugely long term as that to begin. You, you, but you say, here's, we've decided the thing we want to really want to achieve by X date, could be a year, could be 10 years, could, of course, be longer. And that starts to inform each day, each moment, so that you're not just doing emergent strategy. Now, you don't want just to be focused on essential intent and not to focus on what's going around you, because then you could be massively out of touch with the realities of the people you're trying to serve. Uh, And I've made that mistake before in my own leadership, where I say, okay, this is the goal. And then you start to not pay attention to the things that would be educating you as to how to approach this or, or where it's not really working and where to adjust. So you need both. You need, you need focus as both the verb, which is this adaptation we're talking about, this emergent strategy, and you need focus 
as a noun, this intent, this single thing that you're really working towards. And it's this, this, this balance between the two, this dynamic equilibrium between those two that helps you to be relevant now and also making trade-offs towards something that really matters down the road. So another idea you talk about that's in, that you think is vital in order to live an essentialist life is this idea of buffer. What is buffer and why is that important to leading an essentialist life? I was trying to teach my children how to, uh, the idea of buffer and its importance. And we ended up creating a, a, a game uh, where we were driving uh, from point A to point B. And to, to drive in maybe the normal way or maybe the way I normally drove meant that you sort of got a bit too close to the people in front of you. I mean, you had to s- s- slow down, you know, suddenly and then you'd accelerate quickly and then, you didn't quite see the red light was coming, so you had to slow down again. And it's a very choppy experience because there's always unexpected things to come. To to drive with buffer meant, okay, can we go from point A to point B, never stopping the car at all? How would you do that? You know, so it's a smoother journey. It's a smoother way of going from point A to point B. And the way you do it is that you create more space between you and the car in front of you. So instead of being, you know, few yards behind them, you, you might go back 20 yards, 30 yards. And that means that you can, uh, you have the space to, ad- to adapt to the unexpected thing in front of you. So, so that's a physical example of buffer. Uh, wh- why it matters so much in our lives, in our businesses, in the work environments across the board is because the one thing we can expect is the unexpected. We might not know what the unexpected thing will be. I suppose by definition we don't. We can be sure they will come. So if you try and pack your day, your life, your commitment level to the completely fullest degree on the basis that, you know, I can get these things done if everything works perfectly, then, then we can be sure. We can guarantee that isn't how it's going to work. Something unexpected is going to come up. Somebody's going to drop the ball. Uh, some some technical glitch will will occur. You know, these things always come up, and so by putting buffer in our schedule, uh, there's a variety of ways of doing this. I remember the, the CEO of LinkedIn told me that he puts in two hours of buffer in his schedule every day. So he divides it into half an hour segments and. So, so they're just, nothing's planned. So no meeting can be scheduled, no appointments, no anything, because he just knows that unexpected things will come up. Maybe he needs a bit of time. He'll catch up on some email because he's got the buffer to do it. Maybe someone will step into his office who, uh, you know, has, has an urgent situation or something that's vital. Or maybe he'll just sit and use that time to pause, breathe, reflect. That's buffer in action. And it's key to executing on what really matters most. And uh, yeah, that's that's buffer. That's why it matters. I think that, that idea of where we try to cram in as much, like that's the, that's the problem of op- over-optimizing, right? We think we're being really efficient, but then we're thinking being re- we're really, we're being clever, but then it ends up biting us in the butt. And the better way to optimize is actually leave, like it's under-optimize, right? Don't use all of your time. Yeah, that's, it, it's absolutely true. And, and, what I've learned actually just in my own life and, and recently is that you might have to work very hard at this. You might have to paradoxically, in a sense, get busier than you even are right now for a while in order to achieve this. And, and that's okay because that's, you know, it's like you, you, you might have to, let me give you an example. So, so I, I look at my life and I say, okay, look, I'm, I want to be an essentialist. I feel like I'm, halfway towards the revolution you know i've i've made a significant number of changes and they're important but i want to go further and i want to uh, i want a certain kind of life in fact let me let me just share this with you this is i was i was doing um an interview conversation not not dissimilar to this a few months ago six months eight months maybe and the person i was talking to started speaking about where they live and they live on this, uh, live on land, and uh, it's land that they're 
great grandparents bought, and uh, and there's this area on his uh, on his property that's the that's the house that these ancestors used to live in. And he says, I'll go there sometimes because there's no Wi-Fi there. There's no, there's nothing in it. He says, uh, I'll spend time there. Uh, he said, he said, when I'm there, I'm amazed to think, to imagine what the life was for the people who lived there. He said they would work. They get up with the at dawn. They go and, you know, plow the fields, work outside physical labor together as a family. And then once it was done for the day, they would come home. There's no, of course, there's no technology. They would have this hearth experience, uh, meaning literally by the hearth, they would, for the rest of the remainder of the day and fully into the evening until they went to sleep, they would sit, sit by the fire, uh, read, uh, talk to each other, laugh, and they'd eat together. I mean, everything was done by this hearth. Everything was done in this very, quiet and centered place. Let, let, let's just riff on this for a second. Something I learned recently, which amazed me, is that the word focus, it, the root word of focus is hearth. So the word focus, when it was first being used, meant not, not, not just focus on a thing. It meant the focus that is only possible when you're with your family by the hearth, where the, that's where the light is, that's where the warmth is, that's where the family is. That is what focus meant. I think that's quite a profound insight. But when I was having this conversation and he was sort of explaining some of this to me, I had this, this deep connection of I'm only halfway there and I need to do something about this. I need to actually create a different environment. I've probably gone as far as I think I can go in the environment I'm in. And so that began, everything we do has interrelated purposes. And so this is not the only reason I was doing this, but, but I found myself pursuing a different life and saying, where can I have a different life? And so, you know, in that process, and for some other reasons as well, moved to a different environment. Where were we looking? We're looking for a different kind of uh, location. And the place we found is so quiet and so still. It's still got this great community, but it's high on privacy, high in community. But it's compared to before, it's so much space. And, and it took a lot of work to go from point A to point B. And really, I felt sometimes a bit of a, 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 a charlatan essentialist because it was just so much work. And so, but it was in pursuit of this single intent, you know, to, to, to make this change, to choose this different life. And, and we're in it now. And it's just been so profound to, to have set a goal like that, you know, to, to, to really set an intent to get to a place that's less, less noise, less disruption, more privacy ironically more community you know could these places exist it might take a lot of work to get there but then you're there and uh, and in today's environment you have to really work on that uh, so so anyway that's that's something that's very live for me very real for me and i think has relevance uh, for for the people listening to this conversation yeah, I love that. But, but I thought it was interesting. It was a counterintuitive idea you put out there. In order to live an essentialist life, you you might end up doing things that seem unessential to most people, like exploring or just playing or sleeping or not doing anything. I think when most people hear that, they they think, well, that's that that's a waste of time. Like you could be using that time to doing those essential things. Why are activities like that so important to living as an essentialist? Well, so they're not important if you believe that going 24-7, I mean, not if you believe, if it's working for you, then it's not important. Don't worry about all of this. You know, if it, if that if that is creating joy, if that's creating meaningful relationships, if that's creating um, mental wellness, health, uh, and and thriving success personally and professionally, I mean, if, 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 if non-essentialism, is producing those things for you, then you just forget everything we're talking about here because it's all working. But on the basis that actually non-essentialism doesn't work for people, that it creates so much stress, that it creates so much busyness without productivity, that that it, it, that it actually helps people to plateau in their progress. So all of a sudden you think, well, maybe the, maybe the way I've been doing it isn't the right way to be doing it. Maybe Maybe I need, maybe there's a different thing. And suddenly... Some of those different things will feel like slow motion at first. 
uh, will feel so different, like getting off a, you know, uh, uh, conveyor belt, sort of thing. And, and, and all of a sudden you, you're like, whoa, it's so, it's, it's a little discombobulating. And then you say, well, this is real life, playing, playing with my children, just playing with them. Um, going, going somewhere to, to, to go swim with the children, go to, go to the beach, just be with them, laugh with them. So, so stop thinking that that's, that that is the distraction. That's the real work of life. That is life. I, I suggested to somebody one time, I said, you know, sometimes in life, the best thing to do is nothing. And they could not comprehend that idea. Literally, they just, they, they just looked at me like I was crazy. And they started to explain, like, well, you don't really mean nothing, do you? You, you don't, you couldn't really mean that. It must be some other thing you mean. And I kept on saying, I, no, I don't mean that, something else. I mean that sometimes the healthiest thing you can do is to sit there. And to, and the goal is just nothing for just a little while. To, to, you know, to be bored. To let yourself be in that space. And, and you'll find quickly that this, in fact, is a way for much better personal health, that this is a way to much higher levels of happiness. And, and strangely, I think what people will find, especially if you go back to the 100-year vision, they will find that these are the things that actually last. And this is the level of the non-essentialist con, is that it literally is conned us to believing that the stuff that doesn't matter at all is what matters. And the stuff that doesn't, that really matters, doesn't matter at all. I don't know if I said that right. Maybe I just got that wrong. But the, but you get the idea that it's completely reversed what is important and what's not important. Well, I, I was reading my journal not so long ago and, um, and I, back, back, back a few years, I was reviewing a few years back. And I was looking at my entries and I was struck by how much of the, uh, many of the items I'd written didn't matter even this three, five years later, just didn't matter to me. But the entries about when I had played with my children, when I had just had some space and relaxed and been in the present, when I wrote about those things, those things mattered significantly, even this, you know, three to five years later. And that, that, that's what we're going for. Uh, it, it's a different way of living and it is revolutionary. It is different to what the people around us will be doing. But what will be revealed in that difference is a simply a you know, less but better life, uh, and because that's that's the, the the core argument value proposition of essentialism. I love that. Well, Greg, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about uh, your book and your work? Well, I'm. I mean, the the you know the website is a place that uh, that we do add things from time to time with the, the, with, with you know, the the new adventures that were going on. So that's just gregmcewan.com. The latest adventure, the, the, the big thing that's been happening that's interesting is, is we, we, we teamed up with Steve Harvey uh, after he read Essentialism and found it life changing. And we've been working with people in his audience and going to their home and evaluating their life and, and making adjustments. Funny you mentioned Buffer, that one of the people that I worked with, we specifically mentioned on that. So they can go to the website and watch some of those uh, segments and episodes and, and join in this uh, this growing adventure and growing movement. Fantastic. Well, Greg McEwen, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. My guest today was Greg McEwen. He's the author of the book, Essentialism. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You find out more information about his work at gregmcewen.com. McEwen spelled M-C-K-E-O-W-N.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash essentialist, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic. <laughs>